Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Logan and today we are going to be looking at the Magical Botanical Oracle by Maxine Miller and Christopher Pin Pinsack, Pinchek. Sorry, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that last name. Uh, this is a really fucking cool looking oracle deck um, that focuses on plant magic or plant energies and it looks like something that my teenage gothed out self fantasy loving self of high school would have absolutely lost their shit over um this deck is extra special because it comes as an early christmas present from my super dear friend uh i love her so much uh cosmic creeper here on youtube uh she's fantastic please check out her channel and her patreon if you have not she has a lot of really fantastic witchy and tarot content all of which has a very uh Swamp Witch vibe to it. Very uh, Demon of the Bog. Um, she's delightful and uh, offers really great takes on a lot of the more natural uh, practices. So let's jump right into it. I haven't actually gotten a chance to use this deck. I've looked at it um, the other night when it came in, but things have been pretty busy. I haven't actually gotten to use it. So you might notice the book is chunky as fuck. I mean, look at that. Look at that deliciously chunky book. I also love that it's a smaller book and smaller box, and so it doesn't take up three yards of space on my bookshelf like a lot of the current mass markets do. <clears throat> Llewellyn. <laughs> oh, man. Just like print print, uh, print the decks on nicer cardstock and buy small, use smaller boxes and booklets. You'd save a lot of money and you could afford to do the cards that way, but what do I know? Um, by you, I mean the mass market companies. So this delightful package is thick as shit. Um, let's look at the little intro here. So we have pages and the table of contents. We have a forward introduction, plant spirits from the witch's garden. It is all witch garden themed, which is cool. Um, let's talk about the cards. Then they have a nice list of all of the plants involved, alphabetized, which is lovely. Um, I've used plant decks before that were not alphabetized, and it is sh purely love of plants and the artwork that makes me continue using them. Um, because when you're first trying to look them up and you're unfamiliar with the plants maybe and you want to get a, a feel for them, it's a pain in the ass when shit is not alphabetized. So very thankful for that. Um, this forward looks really long, so we're not going to go too deep into it. Um, but it does seem like they talk about, one of them talks about their entry to the world of professional illustration. Um, back in the 70s, where they'd be painting like unicorns, par uh, fairies, that kind of thing. Which, I can't wait to learn more about the artist and the author, because um, that makes a lot of sense with the artwork. So let's look at one of the entries here before we actually look at the deck. So entry for the third card is Bleeding Hearts, which the Latin name, I'm probably going to butcher this, but is Dicentra Spectabilis. Um, this is a flower that I've really had a thing for for years now. Um, where I lived before in Louisiana, it was a subtropic region. And so we don't actually have spring in Louisiana. I live in Pennsylvania now. I much prefer it. No shade to the south. Um, well, some shade to the south, but uh, we actually have spring in Pennsylvania and autumn. It's crazy shit. Uh, it's my first time experiencing either season. I'm 32 currently filming this, um, recording this, whatever. And uh, yeah, I'd seen pictures of bleeding hearts. I was told they could grow in Louisiana, but I'd never actually seen any growing. I uh, didn't see any in nurseries, plant nurseries, uh, that sort of thing. Moved up here, and my very first spring here, I saw these growing along the side of the road at the edge of somebody's yard. And they're so beautiful. And the flowers look so tiny and delicate. And it's just a really stunning plant. So when I saw that this deck had bleeding hearts in it, I, of course, uh, lost my shit. So we also get some planetary associations. For bleeding heart, we have Mars and the Sun, and then for an element they've chosen fire. I'm curious to see if they're going to explain to us why that is. Uh, magical meaning. Bleeding Heart is one of the most evocative plants as the flowers look like the traditional simple image of the 
heart in art and folklore, with a drop coming out of the bottom, implying drops of tears or blood or the act of being pierced. Native to Asia, there is not a lot of traditional witchcraft folklore associated with this beautiful plant. I'm guessing at least as far as like Western witchcraft folklore shit. I'm assuming there's a shit ton about it in Asia, but let's continue. Uh, the plant came to England in the mid 1800s, but it was quickly embraced by many modern witches. Mm, I can't read today. Witches as an ingredient in love magic. Most of the Asian folklore includes images of grief or unrequited love, so perhaps it's not the best for conjuring love. Modern witches crush the live flowers as a source of divination around love, with the red juice indicating yes to love, the white indicating no. Interesting. Have any of you worked with this before? I'd be very curious. Um, I don't. I don't spend a lot of time con contemplating or practicing any kind of craft, but from time to time I'll mix it up. Um, and so I'm always always down for new inspiration uh, in that regard. And I love using um, discarded, naturally discarded, like plant products and things like that. Um, whenever I do. Uh, for plant spirit medicine, it says bleeding heart is a beloved ally in the world of flower essence and plant spirit medicine, used ex used exactly as one would imagine to heal a wounded heart. The spirit of this lovely plant helps people release grief, be it from the loss of a loved one in death or the loss through the ending of a relationship. Bleeding heart uh, helps us to recognize and release codependent relationships, choosing short-term pain in order to move towards health rather than long-term suffering. In chakra healing, bleeding heart balances the heart chakra and helps us keep empathy without being drained by others by recognizing what true compassion is. All very interesting. Yeah, they um, in the back here, they talk about the cards and how to use them, and they do go into using them in craft, using them in like predictive readings for others, using them as like plant allies for daily guidance, that sort of thing. So I think it's really nice that we do get a paragraph kind of for each different kind of use. Uh, for divination, it says, Bleeding Heart asks you to reflect on the unhealed wounds of your heart. Where do you hold on to grief and pain? What unhealthy attachments bind you? What needs to be released to move on with your life? Notice how the plant spirit turns her back, turning away from the past to let it go. Let's see if the image is here. Hopefully you can see that pretty well. Uh, turning away from the past to let it go. Bleeding Heart tells you to seek catharsis often through tears, as the drop is also evocative of tears cleansing the heart. Don't be afraid to cry to heal. Each of the heart-shaped flowers needs to crack and split open to bloom to release the teardrop in order to heal. So it's beautiful. Uh, reverse divination meaning, when bleeding heart is reversed, you are stubbornly refusing to release unhealthy attachments and old wounds. Drag me. You have built identities around your wounded self and fear who or what you will be if you let them go. You are holding back tears and pretending things are good when they are not. Be honest with yourself. Good guy, girl, get a grip. Um, and then each plant also comes with an affirmation. My heart is whole and open to love. I think that's really beautiful. Um, I didn't really know what I was going into when I put this deck on my wish list. Um, I didn't know if it was like... I, I didn't expect it to have affirmations for one thing. Um... I knew it was like roughly 30 cards. I believe it's 33. These are the card backs, by the way. Isn't that lovely? Uh, but yeah, I wasn't wasn't too sure what I was going to be getting. I've had botanical oracles before. Um, I've had a lot of success and uh, healing, growth, whatever you want to call it, using them. I had the uh, volume one of the Pythia Botanica a few years ago, and it was phenomenal. And uh, I only got rid of it because it literally... I've never had this happen with any other deck before. Uh, maybe you have. Please comment if you have. Um, but I got to a certain point with it, and it just, the vibe it gave me was, yeah, well, you know, I've, I've kind of helped you get a lot of your shit together, and there are a lot of other people who I want to help now. So, goodbye. Um, and yeah, I've never gotten that distinct feeling from a deck before, but that one was fucking ready to bounce. It was like, thank you uh, for hanging out. We've had a good time. Peace. And uh, sure enough, I rehomed it, and I, I'd like to think that it did the same thing for them and brought them a lot of lovely and insightful readings. But yeah, um, so I have a really weak spot for plant-based decks, um, and I've had very, I found very few that I like visually, um, so I'm really excited about this one. So a lot of these details are very, very tiny. Let me see if I can, I don't know if we can keep this this close to the camera before editing. 
<laughs> Things said, kind of zoom in a little bit more at that point. All right, we're going to just try it, how we usually do. So we have Angel's Trumpet to start, which is, I knew it was Brugmansia or Brugmansia. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I didn't realize that Detora was at the front of that. Um, I didn't realize how closely related Angel's Trumpet and Devil's Trumpet were, is what I'm getting at. Um, but I adore Angel's Trumpet. Adore. Um, I think it's really interesting when you see it in, um, I feel like you get a lot of what, like rebirth, renewal uh, sort of energy out of it. Let's see what the guidebook says. It might be like, nope, that's not what we're fucking going with at all, which is fine, you know, to each their own. Um, I'm just worried that I might be mixing it up with Devil's Trumpet. Uh -huh. it's so beautiful. You can see it a little bit bigger there. Transition and transformation. Yeah, letting go and stepping into the unknown. So, it's just so stunning. I love the flowers. I used to... Uh, I used to go to high school with some kids who would grab these because these did grow in Louisiana quite uh, quite a lot. Um, it always cracked me up that the uh, law or whatever would allow for Angel's Trumpet to grow everywhere, uh, but not cannabis when, uh, you know, cannabis only does so much when you ingest it. You, you bite a little bit too much Angel's Trumpet, which is what these kids in my high school would do, um, and it makes you trip. But if you bite too much of it, uh, it stops all of your involuntary muscle contractions, which is um, horrifying. But it's a beautiful plant. I would love to try and grow some, even up here where it's a bit chilly. We have Belladonna as card number two, which is stunning. The details are incredibly tiny, so hopefully you can make out some of them. Bleeding Hearts, which we covered in the book just a minute ago at length because I'm a rambly bitch. Calla Lily. I also love that we do have other colors in the deck besides just the, the inky blacks and like the sepia backgrounds. Um, I love Calla Lilies, which you can see here at the bottom and along here. I think the red is a gorgeous touch with it. I'm super curious to see what sort of meaning they attach to it in this book. Uh, the artwork is giving me high drama. <laughs> very drag, very drama. Um, we have Camellia, which is stunning. Uh, my mom has, or used to have these growing outside of her house, and they would bloom even in the cold months. Of course, that was in Louisiana, so the cold months were really like a month and a half of weather that was sometimes 70 degrees Fahrenheit and sometimes 40 degrees Fahrenheit and usually leaned warmer. Um, so take that as you will. We actually do have cannabis in this deck, which I am super curious to read more on, but I just, the art styles within seem rather varied to me, but yet of a suit, you know, like of a family. You can tell this is the same person doing all of them, even though there are variations. All right, Dandelion. We have a lion here, and then the dandelion puff is almost like its mane. I can't. I've never seen a dandelion portrayed that way before. And um, it fucks me up. It does. It fucks me up. Dragon tree, which I've always wondered what those trees were. Never found them online. Uh, find that totally fascinating. And because we have these little... Uh, incense sticks burning at the bottom here. I'm assuming that's the tree you get the resin for dragon's blood from. I'm assuming. Uh, which smells divine, by the way. For fly ag agaric, agaric um, we have these really adorable mushrooms. Fox up here, hare or rabbit here. Little caterpillar, these little fey creatures. It is so cool. I can't wait to, I can't wait to dive into this and see what they've chosen to associate with this mushroom. Hellebore. Beautiful. Now this one you notice we don't actually have a title, um, but we do have artwork of Socrates here, which that paired with the You Will Be My Death, I think should be pretty clear for at least enough people uh, that we're talking about Hemlock. Definitely Witch's Poison Garden vibes. Uh, we have Hinbane here, stunning depiction with these wraith-like wispy figures along the bottom. We have the snake here looking, well, we have a very long tongue, first of all. And then as the snake's body goes on, it 
it breaks down into a skeleton. And then towards the end, I can't quite make it out, but it's almost like it becomes, that's what it is. It becomes like a fissure or canyon running through the land. And then you have hills in the distance. That is fascinating. Super excited to see what that's about. Over here, it looks like we have the symbol for, I want to say Saturn, Jupiter, Earth, and water. So very curious about that. We also have the little wreath down here and a bowl of liquid there. Nothing seems frivolous in this deck or accidental. Like things seem very intentional. For Holly, we have the Holly King, which is just perfect. Beautiful artwork. Beautiful. It just, oh, God, I would have freaked out over this in high school. It's just, it's fantastical. It's dark. It's super intricate. It's very pagan feeling. Sorry, Ivy. We have Ivy here, and we have a winged creature clinging to a tombstone. We have Lavender. We have bees. We have this, like, I guess, like, silk or paper fan with a tassel. We have the plants down here. Just beautiful. I can't wait to learn more about this deck. Love Lies Bleeding. I don't know much about this plant. I know some things about plants, mainly flowers, um, but not everything, and there are a lot of plants. So this is gonna be a fun learning experience. Mandrake, we do have plant peen, of course. Why wouldn't we? Um, very curious about this one. Moonflower, I love and adore. I've mainly seen it growing along beaches in the south, uh, around the Gulf Coast in the US, so I cannot wait to see what sort of associations they've given it. It reminds me very much of Totora, of, you know, Angel's Trumpet. It seems very of a kind, and I just love those trumpet-shaped flowers and how luminous they are in the dark. We have oak. Really lovely details on this breastplate. Really lovely details everywhere, actually. This is a deck that I might need to, like, <laughs> invest in a, a magnifying lens to properly appreciate. Um, I don't usually like cards to be oversized, but since this is only 33 cards, I would have been very down if this was a, an oversized deck so that we could appreciate the artwork a little bit more. But it's so stunning. Poppy, so much red, very like vampiric death vibes, which I think is apt for Poppy. For Rose, this is just stunning. Stunning. They've included so much pink, and yet it still feels gothy. Uh, I cannot wait to dig in. Rue, the Herb of Grace. We have like a rooster head, a dagger, a key, a moon, and a flower blossom. So I'm curious to the relevance of those, since I'm assuming they will have relevant relevance. Um, Sorcerer's Violet. This really makes me want to like dust off my old high school playlists. Uh, pull out like some Switchblade Symphony or some uh, Collide. Not the Howie Day song. Fuck no, not the Howie Day song. <laughs> Specifically Violet's Dance. Uh, it's an old ass Collide song, I think from the 90s. Uh, Sunflower, beautiful. Wasn't expecting something so vibrant and cheerful looking to be in this deck, but I like being surprised. Um, Thistle, it says none touch me with impunity. I think that's really powerful. Very curious to see what this has to say. Uh, very, very attractive and odd thistle masculine figure there coming out of the plant. Thorn apple for Detora Stramonium. Like, fuck me up. So this is our devil's trumpet. Um, I used to grow these in Louisiana, and I would love to start growing them again up here. Uh, again, it's not something I would expect to see in colder climates, but we did visit a uh, an arboretum up here f a few months ago, or a couple of months ago, and it was very chilly out, and they had an angel trumpet, you know, tropical plant, totally thriving. So I think it's possible. I just, I just need to look into it, but um, yeah, devil's trumpet plants are just gorgeous. Poisonous, but gorgeous. Vine. Look at him with them pan pipes. There's hooves in there somewhere, I'm sure. 
again, the detailing is just insane. Willow is stunning. I love this like rounded picture frame departure from the rest of the deck. This is going to be just excellent for really digging in and learning so much. Even if it's somebody else's take on something, it's still a great starting place, you know? I'll have to develop my own relationship with these plants mentioned. I mean, I feel like that's a responsible thing to do for any of us, right? With any, um, any human opinion piece. Uh, I can't wait to dig in. Wolfsbane. Wormwood, which I didn't realize was in the Artemisia family. Beautiful art. Yarrow, look how stunning this jet black figure is with the white wavy hair. Or white textured hair. I can't quite tell what they're going for. It's very tiny. Um, beautiful. Just beautiful. Yew, which I can't wait to see what they have to say about the yew tree. Has anyone here read um, When a Monster Calls? by Patrick Benedict, Benedict, Patrick, I can't remember his name, but it's When a Monster Calls, and it's a story about a little boy who is visited by a sentient yew tree. Um, it will emotionally devastate, especially if you've lost anyone that you've loved, so tread carefully there, um, but powerful story, and so powerful ideas about the yew plant in that book, and I can't wait to see what they do here. And then our last card is the Witch's Garden itself. I am so excited to really tear into this deck. Um, the cardstock is a little on the cardboardy side, but it doesn't bother me. It's, um, I want to say this is a Los Garabeo deck. Yeah, Los Garabeo. I've actually never owned a Los Garabeo deck before. This is my first brush with them. But, uh, yeah, shuffle's well enough. Can we do this other type of shuffle with it? Will I completely destroy it? Hopefully not. Okay, not quite. I don't, I don't shuffle this way a whole lot. Well, fuck. I'm sure it would hold up well if you're actually somebody who knows how to do that reliably. This is a little stiff for me to pull it off with. Um, but... Who do we get? Who do we get? And what are we going to learn about them? Hellebore. So let's look at the entry for Hellebore, yeah? This is number 10. If I, oh, right. It's also alphabetically done. Um, okay. Hellebore. See, there's a... You can really see all the imagery there in the book. I'm so glad they included the pictures in the book really helps us to appreciate the artwork even more, yeah? So we have the Latin name, we have the planetary associations, which are Venus, Saturn, and Mars, and then we have the element of water. So they didn't really go, <laughs> it's a little skull and crossbones next to it, I guess, to signify that it's poisonous. Oh, is that what the red in some of the names symbolizes? Oh, I mean, not the names, the numbers on the cards. I noticed a few of them are in black and then some of them are in red. It doesn't say that for dandelion, though, so maybe not. Oh, well, maybe it says somewhere in the book. Anyway, uh, I was hoping they'd go more to the astrological bits, but that's fine. I can I can dig into that on my own. It's magical meaning. Hellebore is, po is a potent poison, warning us of its nature by burning the mouth when consumed and burning the skin with its sap when touched. Interesting. This quality indicates its power as a powerful and caustic force to set boundaries and offer protection. In an incense, it is used to cons consecrate Saturn talismans and for calling the powers of Mars. And here, when I said they didn't talk about planetary stuff, <laughs> calling the powers of Mars. In folk magic, Elibor would be used ritually to protect cattle from the malign influence of witches. Um, which is a, a funny thing to me. Uh, despite this, Elibor is also a plant associated with witchcraft and the witch goddesses Ecate and... Caridwin, please forgive me for butchering both of those names. I am neither Greek nor Caridwin. What would that be? Norse? I, I think I proved my point, yeah? Um, the root is most often used in necromancy and to gain knowledge or inspiration from the unseen forces of the dark. Interesting. I didn't 
I don't think I've ever seen necromancy mentioned in a, in a guidebook before, so that's fun. Um, these qualities are lent by its less obvious feature. It blooms in the wintertime, often under the snow, giving it the name Christmas Rose, and its growing nature is often at the edge or within forests, though it can also take full light. Another variety, Helleborus orientalis, blooms closer to Easter and is named the Linton or Easter Rose, despite Hellebore being in the buttercup and not the rose family. The ground up root of Hellebore is sprinkled in a circle around oneself for invisibility. I wonder if, I wonder how carefully you have to handle that ground up root. Uh, plant spirit medicine. The deeper mystery of Hellebore is in the darkness, the subtle, the stillness, and the silence. Its healing magic is for those who feel like they are unseen and invisible, or unloved and underappreciated. It aids any solitary healing process where we have to be alone with our pain, grief, and hurt, where we must find the love of the divine, of the goddess, on our own. Elabor can help us feel protected during our healing, but also assists us in dealing with the feelings of isolation. Through our pain, we can awaken to a deeper level of mystical awareness. All right, so we are, we are um, I mean, obviously it's a plant magic deck, so we're going to be in some woo territory. Uh, but I'm also really pleased that not every entry is like melodramatic, um, the melodramatic flavor of some woo texts. Um, yeah. Where do we leave off? Uh, divination magic. Hellebore is found in a reading when we need alone time or to be unseen and unheard. Mm, no. <laughs> well, we need alone time to be unseen and unheard, to reflect upon our own life and our own path. The spirit is gazing off in her own direction, unconcerned about us, doing her own work, and Hellebore teaches us how to do the same. Queen of staying in her own lane. Okay. Of disengaging. Uh, we might need to set the boundaries of our alone time more aggressively as others could impede and pressure us to support their needs. When we are alone and unseen, we will bloom. And then the reverse divination meaning, reverse hellebore indicates not wanting to be alone and feeling alone in the darkness. Rather than choosing to be alone, we feel the choice was made for us by others or circumstances beyond our control. Look to the support of the ancestors and the dark goddess for comfort and wisdom in this time. The affirmation for hellebore, I am silent and still to hear the voice of the goddess. This art is also just really cool. Um, yeah, I... It's also cute. I can't wait to uh, dig into this deeper, especially the parts um, where I guess the creators are going to talk about why they chose the plants. Oh, they have a planet guide. <laughs> okay, cool. So maybe they, they have covered all the bases. That would be really nice. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to dig into this and develop my own relationship with each plant or idea about each plant after more research and working with the deck. Um, because, you know, other people's suggestions are really nice and are great, like, launch pads. But, you know, if I wind up at the same conclusion myself, great. But I could wind up at something different. And so that's why I want to take time with this one and try to make try to make uh, my own bonds with the different components in it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this has been the Magical Botanical Oracle, which is currently available through, like you know, bookstores, websites, that sort of thing. It's mass market from Los Garabeo. Um, I have nothing but good things to say so far. I really look forward to working with it. I'm so thankful to Cosmic Creeper for spoiling me so by sending me this lovely deck. And um, I hope you've had a good time here. I will put a link to where you can find this deck in the description below. And in the meantime, have a fantastic rest of your day.